Uh, I'm not going to speak extemporaneously. I uh, want to say I thank Brother Applin for inviting me to speak here. And when I came in today and walked down the steps and I saw the mural on the wall and just the different effects around the room, I was telling Brother Youssef, this feels like a real black church. I mean, I saw the, the church lessons for the youth and they have, you know, images of African-American youth on them. Now, I'm from the South and a lot of Southern churches use, uh, they uh, order their materials from this Baptist uh, Sunday school market uh, in Tennessee. And you know, they have white images. Uh, hopefully the images you'll see tonight when we get to the slides uh, will change that imagery. And just as Brother Applin mentioned the young brothers and sisters in South Africa who are being killed, kidnapped, and murdered, I want to dedicate this presentation to uh, Stolen Legacy of the African Presence in the Greco-Roman World to them and to all the youth who are dying from crack and from the new thing on the block called bazooka, which is ten times as powerful as crack. I want to First of all, start by mentioning a few great African scholars who blazed the trail in this field. I saw the sister in the audience with uh, George G.M. James' work, Stolen Legacy. Uh, you'll see a photograph of George G.M. James in the slide presentation. But I wanted to begin by saying that throughout the history of Western civilization, the African foundations of that civilization has been distorted, erased, and ridiculed. It is through the records of our African ancestors that we can glaze clearly through the eye of Tahuti to tell the story. The Greeks call him Thoth. It was the indigenous Africans of ancient Kemet or the Nile Valley who heralded this contribution to world civilization. One of the early proponents of Africans being present in the affairs of the Greco-Roman world was, of course, Edward Wilmot Blyton. It was Blyton who was one of the most learned Africans in the African world of the 19th century. He spent a lifetime vindicating our people. He spent also his early years writing. In 1869, in the Methodist Quarterly Review, he wrote the African contributions to world civilizations in an article titled The Negro in Ancient History. He also wrote of Africans in the Greco-Roman world in 1884 in the African Repository. And this is what he wrote. In the earliest traditions of nearly all the more civilized nations of antiquity, the name of this distant people is found. The annuals of the Egyptian priests are full of them, the nations of Inner Asia on the Tigris Euphrates, and when the Greeks scarcely knew Italy and Sicily by name, the Ethiopians were celebrated in their verses by their poets as the most just of men and the favorites of gods. Blyton was followed in 1917 in the Journal of Negro History by a young African-American medical student, George Wells Parker, in an article titled, The African Origin of Gre Grecian Civilization. It was Parker who quoted the European scholar Arthur Evans addressing the London Hellenistic Society saying, whether we like it or not, classical students must consider origins. The Grecians whom we discern in the New Dawn were not the pale-skinned Northerners, but essentially the dark-skinned brown complexion race. Parker even went on a year later in 1918 to publish a pamphlet titled Children of the Sun. It was published by the Hermetic League, and some of the people you see on the list of membership of the Hermetic League are people like Jay Rogers. People like John Edward Bruce, people who walk the streets right here in New York City, in Brooklyn, in Harlem. Parker's conclusions were based upon the latest available research that Ethiopia was the mother of nations and that she had nourished, nourished Kemet and other nations in Asia. Parker went on to quote Henry Schliemann, who was the one who did a lot of archaeological work in Crete and in Troy. This is what Parker wrote. Uh, quoting and referencing Schliemann. He said, yet there were some who cared more for truth than racial glory, and among them was Henry Schliemann. Armed with a spade, he went to the classic lands and broke 
and brought back to light a real Troy. He viewed the tombs and palaces and treasures of Homeric kings. His message back to scholars who waited tersely for his verdict was, it looks to me like this civilization belonged to African people. George Wells Parker then made a startling conclusion that shook the very foundations of, the, of Western civilization when he said that the epics of African people and Helen, the cause of the Trojan War, must henceforth be conceived as a beautiful brown-skinned girl. Now, you might have read different works such as the Odyssey and the Iliad by Homer, but there are other works by these authors of Greece and Rome. But then we had other scholars, African scholars, such as William Leo Hansberry, the father of African-American studies in the United States, a man who was ridiculed his whole academic career until in 1965, before his death, he was recognized by the University of Nigeria, where a history department was named in his honor. Hansberry, in the early teens of this century, as a student of old Atlanta University, had read Du Bois's The Negro. And in it, he realized that the epics of the Homeric kings and gods was indeed an African story. He was relentless in his pursuits of documents on Africans in ancient civilization as well as in the Greco-Roman world. He even found works in his father's library, Eldon Hansberry, who was a professor at Alcorn State College in Mississippi. Hansberry summarized the African foundations of the Greco-Roman world when he wrote, when classical literature was at the peak of its development, Ethiopia and the Ethiopians were favorite and familiar topics with most of the leading poets, geographers, and historians. And finally, in the twilight of the classical age, when the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome was capable of casting but a faint afterglow on the literary horizon, Stephanus of Byzantium, uh, Olympodorus, and others sought to enliven the fading literature of a dying world by giving Ethiopia a prominent place in the historical stories and romantic tales which they endeavored to tell. Hansberry, in 1953, went on to become a Fulbright scholar to Africa. He conducted research in the Cairo Museum in the years 1953 to 54. He served on archaeological field trips in Kemet, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Congo, Ghana, Nigeria, Zanzibar, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, and Liberia. But still there were others. Even though he's very conservative and will not give credit to African people as being more than just slaves in the Greco-Roman world, Frank M. Snowden, Jr., who wrote Blacks in Antiquity, Ethiopians in the Greco-Roman Experience, makes a superb case for Africans in the Greco-Roman world, even though he's misguided. You had others, such as J. Rogers, whom Du Bois had said, no living man has revealed so many important facts about the Negro as Rogers. Then he went on to say of Rogers that Rogers was one of the best African historians writing in his day, even though he was not university trained. But then let me get to George G.M. James, who is an Afro-Guyanese who wrote the book Stolen Legacy, and he documented the foundations of Greek philosophy, education, and the very basis of Greek culture. James, many people talk about the contributions of George G.M. James. George G.M. James was the one that pulled the covers off the origins of Western civilization because the very educational system of Kemet, the mystery system, was the foundations of Western civilization. You had such people as Thales, Socrates, Aristotle, Aristophanes. All these people went back to Kemet to learn from these African masters. And James was the one who penned the work Stolen Legacy. And until 19... 76, the book was first published in 1954 and mysteriously lost until Julian Richardson, along with Asa Hilliard, had the fortitude to seek to have the book republished. It was republished in 1976 and since then 
African people has been, have been treating it as a jewel in their various libraries. But you had other people such as uh, Azikwe from Nigeria, who also wrote articles on the Negro in mythology as far back as the 30s. Then you had um, such people as Carter G. Woodson, who had written a story. But then let me get into some of the meat, such as the various comedic elements that appeared in Greece by way of trade, mercenary soldiers, and by those Greeks who had journeyed by Kemet to drink at the enormous educational centers, places such as Apedai Sut, which was known to us as Karnak. And at one time, this university had 80,000 students. Just imagine the effect of a Greek person going into this university and you see 80,000 people, mostly African people, learning medicine, the development of writing, surgery, trigonometry. But then the oldest Greek tale with comedic overtones appears to be that of Io, the priestess of Hera. And she is said to be the daughter of Anakus, who was the founder of the first dynasty in Argos. And because of Zeus's love for her and Hera's jealousy, she was transformed into a cow. Io becomes maddened by a glad fire and wanders by a long route from Greece to Kemet via the Bosphorus and Caucasus and Syria. While in Kemet, she is touched by the breath of Zeus and becomes impregnated. And she gives birth to a son, Epaphras. And if you know the story of Epaphras, Zeus refers to him as Black Epaphras. The main emphasis of the story of Io is her position as priestess of Hera in Argos, her transformation into a heifer or cow, her journey to Kemen and the birth there of her son, and the fact that the cult of Hera in Argos seemingly dates from Mycenaean times lends support to the theory that Io was contemporary with the 18th dynasty of Kemet, when there was direct contact between Kemet and Greece. In Kemet, the cow was held in reverence from early times. The most prominent cow goddess was Hathor, whose cult was that of great antiquity. And Shek Anti Dia, the deceased Egyptologist, historian, and scientist, had said that in his article, The Origin of the Ancient Egyptians, that Hathor was an African woman. And if you're familiar with some of the work of Dr. Ben, he shows a temple carving, a photograph of Hathor as an African woman. The head, the body of a cow, the head of an African woman. Then, comedic iconography seemed to be an exerted influence on Greek mythology. In Prometheus Bound, Io is called a horned maiden. Either the myth of Io arose under the stimulation of the cult and the iconography of Hathor, Isis, of, or the Greeks already conceived Hera as a cow goddess. Later, it was introduced um, other comedic tales into the story. And what you have is, and what you will see when we get to the slides, is how the Greeks would take an Egyptian or comedic god, transform it, Hellenize it, Greco-Romanize it, and it becomes something totally different. But then they always pay homage. Even in the cult of Isis, where the Greeks had profess, uh, processions down the street, you had people such as Nero participating in them, and they would have statues walking down the streets with statues of Osiris. And then they even changed the appearance of Isis from an African woman till she becomes increasingly, increasingly Europeanized. But let me go on and talk about uh, Greece and Rome, which was in, uh, continuously influenced by the native populations of Kemet. The cultivation of the olive and the use of bees to obtain honey and wax were taken to Greece by an Egyptian named Aristomenes. Even Attica was founded by a Kemite named Kekrops, or Kakepere Sinwosret I. He also founded Athens. Kekrops, or Kakepere Sinwosret I introduced marriage, law, government, and religion to Greece. Herodotus even recorded that the comedic priests taught the Greeks the concept of the universality of the soul. 
Comedic inventions were even stolen by the Greeks, such as uh, Archimedes, who laid claim to the endless screw and the hydraulic screw used to pump water. And I see Brother Kamau in the audience who's doing a lot of research on hydraulic engineering in the Nile Valley. It was Democrates that learned astrology in Kemet, and later Greeks who learned uh, the life-giving methods of agriculture in Kemet. Because Kemet continued to be the spiritual capital of the ancient world, it gave to the Greco-Roman world other gifts of culture. It was the Kemetic priests who taught that music was a form of healing. The use of the science of sound to unify opposites to create harmony or music. Now how many of us have headaches, feeling bad, don't want to be bothered with anybody, and we put on some cold train, or we put on Charlie Parker, and we feel soothed. All, di all this disease, and we put on music, and it heals us, going back to one of our ancient African lessons. According to Herodotus, most of the ancient Greek musical instruments were invented by the Egyptians of the Nile Valley. The triangular lyre, the single flute, the cymbal, the kettle drum, and the sistrum. It was Pythagoras who traveled to Kemet and brought back to Greece the science of harmonies along with the principle of musical scales. It was Abbe Rousseau who believed and stated that the comedic musical system was at the base of the Greek system. Now, what you see is the Greeks, they were cultural borrowers. They were cultural captives of the comedic way or African way of life. If you see someone that can teach you and nurture you, you'll go to them willingly. Not only did they learn medicine and art, they took on dress. Greeks dressing as Egyptians, the Kuro's hairstyle. You begin to see that that came from Kemet also. The Lear, the Greeks and Romans claim Mercury invented from the shell of a tortoise when he chanced to pick it up on the banks of the Nile. It was the native Africans of Kemet in ancient times that led the world in musical development. I remember going to one of the temple sites in Kemet this past summer and seeing the god Bess with the harp. This is 4,000 years before anything in Europe, and this is an African invention. It was clear that Greece and Rome were the cultural capitals of Kemetic culture. In religion, they remained captive for nearly 650 years. I can't imagine living that long or being around that long, but think, barring culture for 650 years, it was the Greeks and Romans who dressed as Kemetic priests and priestesses and borrowed uh, Kemetic African gods. And let me quote you a section of a paper by a friend of mine and someone I think is one of the foremost African educators or African American educators in this country, Dr. Asa G. Hilliard III. And he captures the essence of the era of cultural borrowing in the Nile Valley by Greeks when he wrote in, uh, and spoke at the Nile Valley Conference on the committee concepts of education. And this is what he said. All over Kemet today, one can see the results of Greek and Roman conquerors, efforts to copy the culture that they supposedly conquered. They rebuilt African temples churches and schools and join the African religion. They carved their own images on African temples. They showed themselves being blessed by African gods wearing African clothes and performing, performing African ceremonies. A visitor to Kemet today must wonder as he or she gazes on the many massive African temples that were built by the Europeans why did they go to such trouble? Noble Europeans even had their bodies mummified in the African way. They took home the African religion of Isis, Osiris, and Horus. It remained very popular and prominent until suppressed by the royal edicts. Even then, the f it was the influence of this religion um, at the house of Isis or in Paris where its influence later was found. For instance, Paris, 
means the house of Isis. So if anybody tell you they from Gay from Paris, you ask them do they know what that means, the house of Isis. The Greeks took Serapis, Isis, and Osiris, or the Osiris circle as their own. By the end of the third century, the Greeks and Macedonians, remember Alexander was from Macedonia, had completely adopted the cults of Isis and Serapis, and thereby, of course, those of Anubis, Heru, and Asar. All of these deities, except Anubis, were given Hellenized forms. The cults of Isis and Serapis came to Rome via the Greek settlements in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the fourth century BC, there was already an Isaic sanctuary in the Paris for the comedic merchants of the harbor. This cult grew from the third until the first century BC. During this period, the Isaic cults practiced by the Cosmopolitan Society of Greek trade centers such as Alexandria, Delos, and Potoli, and by mercenaries spread in the Mediterranean world along the sea trade routes. Along the coast of Greece, Macedonia, and Asia Minor, shrines to the comedic gods were built. By the second century BC, there were Roman worshippers of Isis at Delos. And in these temples of Isis, one of the requirements that they had was that native African priests from the Nile Valley, Africans, had to be the priests in those temples, teaching them of this African religion. During the first half of, half of the first century BC, Isaiah shrines were built, though exotic cults were officially prescribed and the comedic religion was considered superstition. In 65 BC, an altar dedicated to Isis on the capital was destroyed by order of the Senate. The official ban was useless. Now they got rid of one temple and they had to build it back. Five Isaiah sanctuaries were pulled down within 17 years and all were rebuilt. Dio Cassius even reports that Anthony, to please Cleopatra, posed with her for a portrait and paintings and a commission of a statue, he representing Osiris or Dionysus, and she, Selene or Isis. After a period of repression under uh, Tiberius in AD 14 to 37, the Isaiah religion, religion settled permanently in Rome with the approval and participation of the emperors. And I want to give you a list of some of the emperors who were swept by the mood of this African religion, the spiritual teachings of this African religion. Many of them were getting happy in the temples just like we get happy in church. Caligula, the one that you saw this crazy freakish movie on, rebuilt one of the Isaiah temples in 40 AD. The cartouche of Claudius was inlaid with an image of Isis. Nero, the one with the fire stick, included Isaiah festivals in the Roman calendar. Vespasian visited the Serapum of Alexandria, commissioned and dedicated to Serapis and Isis. Titus, visited that of Memphis or Haiku Patar and officiated at the burial or installation of the Apis bull. Domitian, who owed his life to the priest of Isis, rebuilt the Isaiah temple after the fire of 80 AD. And under Marcus Aurelius, a temple to the Egyptian Hermes was built in Rome. Commodus possessed zeal, which surpassed all of that of his predecessors, and he could be seen with his skull shaved according to the Isaiah rites, participating in the procession of Isis and knocking on the head of a priest in front of him with a statue of Anubis he was carrying to mortify the flesh. Many of you in your religious teachings hear about mortification of the flesh. Here you see it in Roman times taking a lesson from Kimmy. In the Roman Empire, worshippers of Isis resisted Christianity as late as the end of the fourth century, at which time one could still see the old procession go through Roman streets. Although Hellenized and Romanized, Isis, an African goddess, was the true patron saint of the Greco-Roman world. There were even other evidence 
There's epigraphical evidence in the form of coins and other means for the worship of comedic deities in the Hellenistic world, which is illustrative of the extensive power of the influence of Kemet. On many of the coins of Asia Minor, there were comedic figures. Before the time of Alexander, the horned head of Amun, and you will see a slide of Zeus Amun in the slide presentation, taking on and borrowing from Amun, the comedic god. There also appeared in Asia Minor on coins issued in the, in the fifth and fourth century representations of Zeus, as I had mentioned, uh, borrowing from Amun. There were other coins at Malta of the second and first century before Christ that showed the cult of Isis and its importance. There were also cults of Isis in Crete. You will see maps showing how the cult of Isis goes from Memphis and from inner Africa, northeast Africa, the Nile Valley, up into southern Europe, Sicily, Greece, and Rome. And many of you wonder, well, where did this Black Madonna story come from? This is the story that you see in the story of Isis and Horus or, or Set and Heru. Evidence of the Isaiah cults are present in bas reliefs and coins and other antiquities found in Megara, Corinth, and Argos. It is also in the area of science, mathematics, and medicine that comedic civilization gave impetus to the Greco-Roman world. Scientifically, the Camites were the masters of science in the ancient world. Diop says of them, it is only when the Greeks came to Kemet, principally Archimedes, that he uh, came back from Egypt and said he invented the endless crew after seeing it in Kemet. Then he further states that the formula C equals pi times D is attributed to Diostratus. This formula which gives the length of the circumference of what is believed to have been established by the Egyptians as the circumference of a circle has been alleged to have been originated by a Greek author. But it was also known that Astrastenes was the one that coined and invented the circumference of the circle. They go on to list other persons, such as Hippocrates, who we all know was not the real father of medicine, but Imhotep. It is important that the Camites of the Nile Valley produced the world's first physicians, included, uh, they produced the world's first medical knowledge and literature. It was the native Africans of Kemet who influenced the contributions of Hippocrates with the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, it was Hippocrates in his own essay on ancient medicine that reveals the invention of medicine that came from the Camites. Even Pythagoras returned to Greece uh, and then to Cronin, Italy, where he established a brotherhood imitating the comedic priesthood in dress, practice, and philosophy. The Greeks and Romans both continued to use comedic, comedic methods of arithmetic. Even G. Sarton believed that the ancient Gr Greeks believed Kemet was the birthplace of astronomy. It was also in Alexandria that native Africans continued to bestow comedic genius on the Greeks. But then you had cases where comedic gods were barred by Greeks. Asar or Osiris, Osiris being a Greek name, of course, becomes Dionysus or Serapis Pluto to the Greeks. Oset or Isis becomes Demeter when she becomes Greek. Heru, when he gets to Greece, changes to Apollo. Neith becomes Athena. Hathor, the African woman, becomes Aphrodite. Amun becomes Zeus. Tehuti becomes Hermes. Ptah, Hephaestus, Amun-Ra becomes Ares, Khonsu becomes Hercules, Imhotep becomes Escalapius, heru Katu becomes Hermachus, the Banu bird becomes the Phoenix, Nut becomes Ray, 
Ra becomes Helos, Seb becomes Kronos, Set becomes Typhon, and Apu becomes Pananopius. So you see, for 600 years, the Greeks, after 332 BC, and after being prohibited for 5,000 years, came and were educated by Kemetic priests in increasing numbers. They studied directly in the Kemetic mystery system, even though there were restrictions. Even Pythagoras was given a runaround when he went to Heliopolis to be educated by the Kemetic priests. They were taught by others who had direct contact with the Kemetic priests, and the Greeks, as I said, were taught fragments. They were not given the whole story. But scholars knew this. They knew the African contribution to the Greco-Roman world. They knew that the Greeks got their knowledge from ancient Kemet. But then there was the big ripoff. Up until the 19th century, the story was told that Africa gave impetus to the Greco-Roman world. Then because of racism, the story began to be changed. You had cases where whole new histories were written. There was a place in Germany called a university called Göttingen University. And this uni at this university, some of the major educators were educated from Germany and England. The university was founded in 1734 by George II. He was later the lector of Hanover and the king of England. And at this university, they laid the foundation for racism, colonialism, and imperialism. And I'm going to give you some of the names and some of the highlights of some of these professors who shrouded many of their own people in ignorance about the story of the African contribution to Greco-Roman civilization, our stolen legacy. That was Johann Wickelmann. And Wilkerman was recognized by many as the founder of the academic discipline of his story. He worked mainly in the 1780s and 90s, and he even described comedic or African art as primitive. But then when he described these Africans, he said they were snub-nosed and bandy-legged. Then there was John Frederick Bulenbach. And he developed the theory of race, including the superiority of the Aryans. And he was a professor of natural history and introduced the term Caucasian into our language. Then you had Carl Muller. And he was the person who developed the system of source criticism. And this was the first step in discrediting editing ancient sources. All those people such as Homer, Herodotus, and telling people that these people didn't know what they were talking about, even if they saw a comedic person or an African person standing right before them, that they were crazy, in essence. Then you had uh, people such as Frederick or Christoph Human. You had Auguste Wolf, who was the librarian at Gottingen University. And he was the one that felt that Homer was the signal for the beginning of European civilization. And then there is some question as to whether Homer existed, because there were a number of different Homers. Then you had, of course, Christian Bunsen, who was an Egyptologist. You had A.H. Herin, uh, who was a professor of history. And this person, Herin, was ostracized because he felt that the ancient model was correct and he didn't want to agree with them regarding the uh, African origin of Greco-Roman civilization. But the story shows that we are a people that influence war world culture and civilization.
Europeans go back to Greece and Rome for their cultural heritage. This is our culture and this is our heritage. But what you're going about to see is how they were influenced by us, that they were a mixed culture, a culture of cultural parasites. Just as you look at the idiot box and see them using our music for background music, for, for skits and so forth, just as they put King Cut's dog food on the air rather than put an African person in comedic dress, they'll put a dog up there, you know, uh, trying to portray our culture. But let me go to the first slide, the title slide, brother. Can someone kill the lights up here on the stage? Yes, please. Okay. As you know, the presentation is the, the stolen legacy, the African presence in the Greco-Roman world. Next slide. This presentation was, was inspired by the work of George M. James and Stolen Legacy. Now, many people search through, and, and part of this is to show you how you can take your own imagination and you can take the image, one image, to speak for you uh, in your historical quest for our history. George Jim James, a teacher at Pine Bluff, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. This is a photograph that I was fortunate to find of him. And I like to see what people look like, uh, find out what kind of work they did. I found out also that he published in the Georgia Herald newspaper, and if any of you are interested, you can find some of the articles uh, at the University of Georgia Library, or you can get the Schomburg to send for them or send copies for them. Next slide. Now, we talked about African influence in the Greco-Roman world. We know that Tarsetti was before ancient Kemet. 3100 BC was the, uh, the start of the first dynasty in Kemet. But then you had the pyramid ages in dynasties one through two, uh, excuse me, one through 12. You later had the temple building age in dynasty 18. But from here all the way down, except to the invasion by the Hyksos, which was really a period of, dis of, of destruction, and they gave nothing cultural to the Nile Valley, only disruption. Then you go down to 1000 BC, paralleling with the 25th dynasty in 770 BC. Then you get down here to 332 BC, where you get to the Greeks. Then, of course, 1 AD, you come to Christ. But from this period, over 3,000 years, down to the Greeks, you had Comitic or African civilization influencing the world. No white people until you get down here to these Greeks. And then even they can't recount of their history because at 332 BC until down to 500 BC, they say that that was the heroic age. No written record. Next slide. Little focus. You might not even see this, but this is the same, same timeline. But I show you here, during the 4100 to 4200 BC, you see the zodiac or astronomy. You see surgical instruments here between 4000 and 3000 BC, the origin of medicine. You even see the, the boat of, of, of Khufu. And here you see dynasties one through 12. You see Khufu, who many Europeans say built the uh, Hora market or the Phoenix as you know it, but he only repaired it. Then you have Zosa, who commissioned this man, an African, Imhotep, the real father of medicine, to build the step pyramids. And here you see Menes, which Diop says was the first king on earth at 3100 BC, who united up in Lower Egypt. Now he was not the first king to come. You had people such as Scorpion who ruled before him, but he is the first recognized king of Egypt because he united up in Lower Egypt. You'll see another clear slide of him. All of these people are African people creating shipping, temple building, medicine, and astronomy.
long before you get to the Greeks and the Romans. So go to the next slide. Now many people say, well, who are these people in Nile Valley? Here you see on your left, ancient Camite of the Nile Valley or African of the Nile Valley. You see the Persians, the Syrians, you see here a Nubian. Now, you don't see, if you can focus that a little bit, it might be the angle of the slide projector, but both of these are dressed similar, and they dis didn't distinguish between each other racially. It was a cultural difference between the Camites of the Nile Valley and those of Lower Nubia. Next slide. And, that, and this clearly shows you what is an uh, ancient Camite and what is a, a foreigner. Next slide. Of course, I had to add this. This shows you indigenous Africans of the Nile Valley, photo taken about 1950 uh, in the Nile Valley in Aswan. Next slide. Of course, I said the first king on earth, many is or Aha, or many of you might read of him as Nama. Now, if that's not the brother in the street or person in this audience, I don't know who is. And no one can tell me that this is a European and that this was a Caucasoid black that founded Kemetic civilization that influenced the Greeks and Romans. Next slide. Now, this is Seneferu, one of the pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. This is in the British Museum. As usual, the nose is gone. But you still see the African features. And I'm showing you this to establish what the ancient Camite look like because people still feel that Egypt is not in Africa, that the ancient Camites or the Egyptians were a European people. Next slide. This is a mural from the dynasty of Menahotep. This is Kim Set, Queen Kim Set here. Notice the dark Hugh, just as you'll see of, of Amos Nefertari, an African woman. Now you see what they portray foreigners as, and you see what they portray themselves as. Next slide. This is Amos Nefertari. One of the, she's the founding queen of the 18th dynasty. And people mistake her, and they attribute things that she did with Nefertiti. Nefertiti comes later in the reign of the 18th dynasty. She was the wife of Amos I, the one who fought the Hyksos. She also had a son, Amenhotep I. This woman was an administrator, ambassador, but many people, like I mentioned to Dr. Van Sertema in his Black Women Antiquity uh, Journal, that there needed to be a story on this woman's life. Because we get everybody else, we get Hatshepsut, we get Queen Ty, but this woman is very important. She advised her son, she was a, as an, an advisor in her family for over 40 years. Next slide. Of course, here you see her with her son, I'm in Hotel the first. Still those African features. And as we all know, the black of the berry, what they say, sweeter than juice. Next slide. <laughs> Queen Ty. This woman was the wife of I'm in Hotel the third. They say he commissioned seals to her from, from uh, was it, Sinai to Nubia. Build a sacred lake for her. He loved her so much. Uh, when you're going toward, I think, the Valley of the Kings in the Nile Valley, you come across uh, two of the Colossals. They call them the Colossi of Memnon. That's what the Greeks called them. But they are really statues of Amenhotep III. And I have seen many pictures of Amenhotep III and those, seat, those seated statues of him, but I never really noticed that on the side of his leg, on his knee, stands Queen Ty. That was the first time I really had noticed it. But as you see, she's a good old sister. 
Next slide. Thutmose the third, who Jane Rogers said was a Napoleon of antiquity. I say the Napoleon, when he went to the Nile Valley, might have found out about this brother and wanted to use some of his exploits. This is, of course, is in the British Museum. And look at the nose and the lips. Covered all the way up into parts of Asia. Next slide. Okay, now uh, I showed you what the people in the Nile Valley look like, some of their features. Now, here we start with their contributions. This, I mentioned Osiris, or Asar. Asar is a comedic name. Osiris is a Greek name for this god. African features. This is the one that Isis goes around. She loves him so much, she, when he's killed, like his brother said, he goes, she runs around and goes around the land finding his dismembered bodies, whether they were 14 or 28 pieces, and puts them back together. This is an African person. And in other slides you will see, in pictures you will see him as a black god sitting on a throne. Next slide. The Africans, originators of religion. Mention religion. The day of judgment scene where your heart is weighed against the feather. If you led a good life, a life of struggle, a life of truth, a life of righteousness, it would balance, your heart would balance with the feather and you would enter in what they conceived as heaven at that time. If you led a wayward life, of course it would be heavier. And you know people who live wayward lives it's always things on their shoulders, a heavy weight. Next slide. And uh, of course, this is the day of ju judgment. That's where you get the day of judgment from. Next slide. Evening shot, or twilight shot, of Har M. Akit, Horus of the Horizon. The true name of the Phoenix. I'll show you a later slide where you'll see a nice shot, but this shows you the African features of this statue or piece of architecture in the Nile Valley. Next slide. Here's a colonnade in the Nile Valley. I think this is Karnak or sections of what the university was called, the Apet I Sut. Those 80,000 students came to. Next slide. Of course, this is the glider plane that Dr. Van Sertimer had reported in Blacks and Science of the Nile Valley, showing how Africans of the Nile Valley were experimenting with aeronautics and aviation. It was mistaken as a bird placed on display, and they realized that this was not a bird, that this was a plane. Not so far-fetched when you look at the level of medicine, circumcision, that the ancient Camites of the Nile Valley were practicing. Next slide. Called surgical instruments, showing how these priests and doctors, they had whole schools such as the House of Life. You even had commissions of medical doctors who performed different surgical feats in the Nile Valley. Now this is over two to three thousand years before there's a Greece or there's a Rome. Next slide. Or oh, Hippocrates. I mentioned the African origin of medicine, of course. You might recognize this from Brother Earl Sweeting's pamphlet, African History. It was republished, I think, this year out of London, showing Africans uh, in the study of chemistry. And of course, you know the name Kim, or chemistry comes from Kim. All right, next slide. Study of medicine. And many of these paintings are in, at the University of Ghana. And uh, Earl Sweeting, of course, died a number of years ago, but he was a native of New York. He painted many of his paintings. Uh, they first came out as small cars. Uh, later, they became uh, a book. Next slide. 
I spoke of astronomy. This is, I think, in the Temple of Hathor. This is a zodiac sign. Of course, you see the rays of the sun. These are the legs. These are the heads. And this shows you the early African concept of the universe and the stars. And you know of the God, earth god Gib and the goddess of heaven in comedic times. Next slide. Of course, the first library in ancient Kemet. Papyrus, writing, all of this educational systems that the Greeks came to learn of. Next slide. Dentistry. And many, Rosalie Davies uh, wrote a book called, I um, forgot the name of the book, but in it, it shows her dissecting mummies because they wanted to find out what kind of diseases they had and they were marveling at the dentistry of these uh, that the um, ancient Camites practiced in the Nile Valley. Next slide. Course writing, papyrus, the invention of papyrus, or paper. Next slide. Writing, I mentioned writing, the Medu Necha. And I know uh, Sister Deidre or Raketi Wimby is teaching the Medu Necha uh, here in New York. And it's important that we realize that writing came from the Medu Necha. Next slide. Of course, we all talk about reading and books. This is Patah Hotel. And his book, his teachings, are our oldest surviving or completely surviving record of the first book in the world, or the oldest book in the world by an African person. And this is a temple rendition of him taken from his tomb at Saqqara. And we were not even supposed to go in his tomb when we went to Saqqara. And I knew his tomb was there. And so a couple of us told the guy, look, we want to go see the tomb of Ptah Hotel. And we went in and we supposedly sneaked this photograph. So here you see Ptah Hotel. Next slide. Of course, shorthand. And Tyro, who was an African, was the inventor of shorthand. Next slide. Here you see again, writing. Next slide. Again, the timeline. All that you saw came before these Greeks got here. Those were African contributions. Next slide. Here you see the Greeks. Now here's where the Greeks come in. 332 BC. Now here you begin to see how they borrowed, how they stole from us. And you know how leeches and parasites leech on the people and drain the cultural heritage of a people. Next slide. Now, Herbert Wynn in Search of Man had this to say about Africans in the Nile Valley. He said, so great was the achievement of the Africans in the Nile Valley that all the great men of ancient Europe journeyed there. The philosophers Thales, Anaximander, the mathematician Pythagoras, the statesman Solon, and an endless stream of historians and geographers whose works are all based on Herodotus' outstanding description of Egypt to which the second volume of his history was entirely devoted. If you want to read more about what Herodotus had to say, read book two and book four of his histories. Then it goes on to say, in Blacks and Science, the most brilliant of the Greek students of science, such as Thales of Miletos, Democritus, Pythagoras, and Eudoxus, traveled to Egypt to study. Seneca tells us that Eudoxus had to go to Egypt to study planetary motion, and that at that time, Egypt must have been the world's leading center of astronomy. Pythagoras spent no less than 22 years in Egypt studying astronomy, geometry, and the mysteries. Next slide. Here you see a Greek lady. Now this is what they look like. And there's no 
discrepancy in how the Greeks look as opposed to the ancient Chemites. Next slide. Here you see Osiris, the black god I had showed you and the statue that's in the British Museum previously. He later becomes Zeus. Next slide. Here's Isis. Now look at those African features. But then you're going to begin to see some things that begin to change with Isis. Next slide. Here you see her again, embracing her husband Osiris, protecting him. Next slide. All right. Here is a map, even though it's in French, it's the principal centers of the Isaiah cults in Egypt. Abydos or Abdu, her Hercopolis, here in Memphis. Now these are the Isaiah centers in the Nile Valley. Next slide. Now watch what happens with these maps. All right. I mentioned Memphis. Here's Memphis. The diffusion of the Isaiah cults. You see them leaving Memphis. They go to Cyrene. This is Crete. Southern leg of Italy, or what became this Italy, Thessaly, on up into Southern Europe. You begin to see this cult leave. Now watch what happens to Isis' form. Next slide. I mentioned the Isaiah procession. These are the sistrums. The Isaiah priest, the shaven head with the side lock. This is Greece. Next slide. I mentioned how they worship Osiris. You see the double crown, Hellenized version of Osiris, Isaiah priests. You begin to see them worshiping African gods, changing African features of African gods, but worshiping African religion. Next slide. This is a slide of Isis and Horus or Set and Heru, the mother and child, the original black Madonna and child. And of all places, this was found in Sicily. You heard me? This was found in Sicily. An African god, a committed god, and as far as Sicily. Next slide. Again, you see, this is Isis in the middle. This is Osiris. Can you see the other figure of Isis? You begin to see the figures change as they go up into Greece and Rome. Next slide. Here you see them in Sicily again. Osiris. You see Isis. She becomes more and more Europeanized. Next slide. Remember I told you that in Rome and in Greece, one of the things about the temples, the Isaiah temples, was that they had to have native African priests teaching the mystery system and the Isaiah religion. They didn't bring in any of their buddies. They wanted the real thing as far as they could get it. Here you see these black priests. And here you see the Greeks learning this African religion. Next slide. Not only did they learn of our religion and our culture, they even wanted to dress like us. This is a Roman priest. Remember now, we're going to get to the Kuros hairstyle. You see the hairstyle beginning to change and the bust and the statue. They even uh, tried to experience, uh, experiment with the metal nature. Next slide. I say priests again, the temple scene. Increasingly you see that it has been a 3,000 year legacy that Europeans always try to use our culture. ISIS. This is in Athens. Next slide. Of course, they begin to change other things. I mentioned Bess. This is Bess from ancient Kemet. 
Now let me show you what he begins to change into. Next slide. They have supposedly a bust of Hathor on the top of his head. And here you see Bess again. But he's going to change again. Next slide. This is as he becomes anglicized. Increasingly European features. Changing that original African source, leaving the source and going far away from the original source. Next slide. Of course, a Romanized version of the god Ptah. I mean, they change, stylize it, and you begin to lose the true meaning of the source. Next slide. Of course, we go back, we get down here, they're still trying to borrow from African people. Next slide. I mentioned the hairstyle. This is the Kuro's hairstyle. A committee hairstyle that the Greeks borrowed or stole from African people. Next slide. This is an earlier period. And you begin to see that hairstyle, that African hairstyle. You begin to hear, you begin to see more and more how they become Europeanized in the statues. Next slide. Of course, the Harem Akit, a true African brother. And of course, you know that Napoleon blew his nose off. And there are reports from a letter I've seen and from information Dr. Van Sertima has that the beard and nose of the face of the Harry Market is in the British Museum. Next slide. That's what the Harry Market becomes in Greece. I mean, uh, they really had it bad. Next slide. Of course, the scientific technology of African people was in the Nile Valley with the pyramids. But then the Greeks also borrowed that too. Began to destroy its true meaning and look at what you see in the artist's rendition of one of their mausoleums. Next slide. A reconstruction of a mausoleum, 353 BC. Concept of the pyramid on top. Next slide. They even went so far as trying to use the crowns of ancient Kemet. And this is from Rome. Next slide. Not only did they want to dress like us, worship like us, they wanted to try to be initiated into the mystery system. Now here you see a Greek trying to be initiated. And if anybody is going to the Nile Valley with Dr. Ben this summer. There's a room that they never take you into at the Cairo Museum. It's the Greco-Roman room. And in that room you'll see some of these same statues of how Isis, Horus, Heru, Asar changed into Greek versions. And you'll see the same thing. You'll see mummy cases with a Greek painted on a coffin lid with the crown of Osiris. Now how hypocritical can you get? Next slide. Here they are in our dress, Roman times. Now that, to me, that, that, that really, you know, turns my stomach because one, you're taking African culture and you're placing another culture inlaid over top. And you can never be yourself by aping other people. That's a message to us from 3,000 years of history. Next slide. This represents one of the sons of Caracalla. And he still has that Egyptian dress, Egyptian headpiece. This is in the Cairo Museum, too. Next slide. Isis. And this is in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. She completely changed from what she was as an African woman to a European woman, preferably Goldilocks. Next slide. 
Back to the timeline. You have to deal with where we were in time and space and where these Greeks were and what we were doing in the world at that time. You had even had people such as this man, Amenemat III, who the Greeks thought was Memnon. Then you had people such as Sesostris the first, or St. Rosewood the first, who was the founder of Athens. Next slide. Of course, philosophy. You know the African proverb, same thing in ancient Kemet. Tale of two brothers. Uh, the transcriptions of uh, and reinterpretations of comedic literature by uh, Milana Karinga. All these dealing with the philosophical cultural heritage of African people. Of course, this is Sweden's rendition of Aesop. But then, look what Aesop becomes from this brother in the middle to this next slide. That's not the same person. They even have him naked with a club. And this is in Italy. Next slide. I mentioned Athena. This is Neith, the Egyptian goddess. Now watch what she becomes when she becomes, and, and even the Greeks go back and say that Athena supposedly have been related to, or her attributes related to Athena. But here's what Athena is in Greek culture. Next slide. This is Athena. Next slide. Now we talk about rulers and so forth in Greco-Roman times. This is September Severus, the one who they say never lost his taste for food and who died in Gaul or France. Right? This is him on horseback. And a hunt. This is a glass plate from Roman times. Next slide. This is what he becomes when they Europeanize him. Next slide. Now this is what Earl Sweeney tried to capture with the brother on parade. Next slide. I mentioned uh, Minimat III, or the one that the Greeks called Memnon, the one who supposedly tried to save Troy. This is the brother in the Cairo Museum with what looks like dreadlocks. No mistaking who this brother was. Next slide. This is what they say in the artist's drawing is Memnon. But then they even put an image of an African on the shield. A little bit of truth, but never the whole story. Next slide. I mentioned Sesostris or Sin Wars Red the first, found of Athens. This is he in the Cairo Museum. Showing how Africans still had influence in the Greco Roman world. That it was not this European culture that we hear about when we take the humanities and they throw on Homer, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle to us and saying that they gave the cultural foundation to the world when it was these black Africans who did it. Next slide. Back to the timeline. And I can keep throwing this timeline at you because you have to study chronology. You have to know what came first what came last, what came in between, but always what came first, because that's the true story. Next slide. I mentioned Zeus and I mentioned Amun. This is Amun, the god Amun from the British Museum. Now watch what the Greeks do to him. Next slide. Zeus Amun with the horn. You saw what he was in Kemet, now you see what the Greeks made it. Now look, look at the next slide of it. Here he is. But then you even see committed representations. This is he seated here. This is supposedly the falcon. You see other committed symbols. 
on corn. This is how they bastardize our culture, bastardize our heritage, where today we don't even know that that's where our culture came from. Next slide. Other gods and goddesses during the heroic age of Greece, when they had no written script, supposedly, even though we had started writing in the Nile Valley. This is a vase in the museum in Vienna. This kinky-haired, brown-skinned person is Hercules slaying the priest of Viserys, the king of Egypt, showing him as an African person. Next slide. Here you see him stringing a bowl still with kinky hair and Africard features from a coin. Now this is the legacy that we don't know of that they refuse to teach. But I'd say to you, you're here with three or four museums. The Metropolitan Museum has files, photographic files of everything they took out on any expedition. And you can go in, get copies of those images. The one I showed you of Kim Set, wife and queen of Minahotep, came right out of the Metropolitan Museum. Next slide. Okay, go to the next tray. And I hope you can see this African heritage, this stolen legacy that we have lost and will never let you forget. Next slide. You remember the story of, of Odysseus? Well, there was a so-called sorceress that really got on his nerve, Circe. This is she as an African woman. Next slide. Of course, us teaching the Greeks mathematics and engineering. Next slide. M. Hotep, the real father of medicine. Next slide. Of course, the skull of King Tut showing the division of the left and right ventricle of the brain. The urea symbol, symbol of life, showing that African people in the Nile Valley knew medicine. Next slide. Again, we have to think about time. Next slide. This is Ptolemy IV, showing you what they look like, what our cultural parasites were. Next slide and how they were in love with African culture. Even in the artwork, you see them paying tribute to the African. Next slide. Again, with the deep, beautiful African features on a base. Next slide. Young boy on, I guess that's uh, not a ram, but a llama, I guess. Next slide. I mentioned September Severus, African Emperor of Rome. This is from a coin. This is he here. And this was found in South Central Turkey. Next slide. African on a bracelet in Greco-Roman times. Next slide. Earrings. Can you imagine a Greek walking around the streets of Greece with the earrings of an African on their ear? It wouldn't be any different from seeing a European in a dashiki or with kente claws on. Next slide. You can. Next slide. I mentioned uh, Crete, which came before Greece and was colonized by the ancient Chemites. This is supposed to be the captain of the blacks from ancient Crete. And remember, I showed you the map of the Isaiah coast going from Kemet into Crete. They not only 
took religion, but they took culture and leadership to that area too. Next slide. Mycenae also predated Greece and Rome. See Mycenaean priestess. Next slide. Here you see them again. Full figured African women from Mycenae. Next slide. This is from Greece, an African boy. Those look like dreads to me, or cornrows. Next slide. This is a vase from African brother. This is supposedly from Phoenicia. Next slide. Of course, many of us know the story of Hannibal and the Alps, the Punic Wars, how they spent generations and how he swore eternal vigilance against Rome. Next slide. Coins of Hannibal with the elephant. Europeans still refuse to believe that that is Hannibal. Next slide. The elephant that Hannibal supposedly had ridden into the Alps. Next slide. Now these are figures of African people during the Punic Wars like a brother with a bush. Next slide. Again, sister and brother in Punic times. Next slide. Here he is again. Peppercorn hair. One of our trademarks. Next slide. Go on. Now, we go back to our source, to Khufu, other Dominic pharaohs. Next slide. Because I'm in Hotel, Sonam Hapu, builder of uh, Karnak Temple. We go back because you got to go back to the source to find our heritage. Because it has been stolen, it's been corrupted, and it's been hidden. But it's our task to find these images to show their influence. One picture they say is worth a thousand words, but until you have the knowledge and the concept behind that picture, or put it in proper context, you still don't have the, the right story. Next slide. This is Amenhotep III, who was the husband of Queen Ty, the one who spread the seals from Sinai to Nubia. Next slide. Many sisters wear the necklace with Nefertiti around their neck. And many of them are the Europeanized version of a bust that they found in the Berlin Museum. They don't know where or who it is of. They just they claim that it's Nefertiti. This is from her tomb. And this is what she looked like. Of course, Tahaka of the 25th Dynasty. Next slide. And it's all a mind game. You know, they're playing games on our mind, and it's our task to liberate our mind, to free our mind. Next slide. And just as John Henry Clark says that if you want to find a friend, you look in the mirror hoping that you'll find yourself. But please hope and pray that 3,000 years of history will liberate the young brother from seeing Superman on the other side of that mirror. Next slide. I want to add these, to the next two slides, for a purpose. I was looking through a computer magazine one day, and they had this ad. From a mythological past to a dangerous future. Games, computer games now. The Seven Spirits of Ra, a game. It says it challenges you to an adventure from 3,000 years ago. Experience the authentic drama of an ancient Egyptian myth. Fight through tombs, pyramids, caverns, and swamps. Test your mind against complex, multi-level passages. Overcome sudden perils and surprises from evil forces and guardian demon and Kemet, the true source of world civilization. Next slide. And of course, I had to put Malcolm in. Because our story from ancient Kemet, from the foundations of world civilization, has to be a story 
that we teach our young people, that we teach our kids, that we read to them, that they recognize the images of our people, that they know our heroes, that they know the difference between Amun and Zeus Amun, that they know the difference between Imhotep and Hippocrates, and hope that if they graduate from medical school, that they won't swear by Escalapius, but swear by Imhotep. This is the story we have to tell, and it's a long story that's long overdue. Next slide. Thank you. Oh, by the way, if any of you are interested, have some brochures on the table for the teachings of Pata Hotel, a book I helped co uh, edit. And I have some tapes from the Nile Valley tapes that was held in Atlanta in 1984. I have Dr. Kofor on Black Peoples and Personalities in and all the Bible, <laughs> Renoko Rashidi on the Nile Valley Presence in Asia, and uh, Naeem Akbar on the Nile Valley Origin of the Science of the Mind. But I would like some questions. While I'm thinking of the questions, I need some copies of these. Okay. So there's plenty of material in the back, and also, didn't you have a book here? Uh, no, no, I just had both. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, material is in the back, and I cannot believe that there is not one question this evening. number of readings, uh, let me give you, take the key from Dr. Ben and give you some African sources. I mentioned George Wells Parker, uh, Children of the Sun, it's a pamphlet you probably can get at Liberator Bookstore. There's also a book by Henry O'Leela, he's a brother from Kenya. He wrote a book called From Ancient Africa to Ancient Greece. Then uh, one book that you know, I would recommend to you because it, it weaves a lot of stories, uh, but he recaps on a lot of uh, information by African historians. Um, uh, who is it? Martin G. Bernal's book, uh, Black Athena. Then, of course, uh, can't let you forget uh, Dr. Ben's Africa, the Mother of Western Civilization because he has a chapter on it, and he also has a uh, pamphlet uh, on uh, Tyler in pursuit of, uh, of George G.M. James' Stolen Legacy. I think that's the title of it. And I also have, if he could run a copy of it, I have a bibliography that goes with the presentation I made, and if uh, Brother Applin wants to run a copy of it, then he can make it available to, uh, to people here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I seen a bigger book, the old book on the door. I seen the Tahoe Temple. I seen a bigger book, a paperback, white cover, about that size. I don't know if you've heard that book or no other. Are you talking about the oldest book in the world by Myers? Right. Uh, uh, and I just found out that uh, brothers G.K. Osei or Gabriel K. Osei had recently passed, but he was the one that reissued uh, the oldest book in the world by Myers. And what he does is he takes a lot of the, the papyri and the, the books, fragmented books, and weaves them together into this book. And I think it was published in like 1906 or 1907. I would suggest that if you were looking for that one in, in particular, to contact Brother Simmons, George Simmons, if he's up and about now, to see if you can get a copy of it. Yes. Can you elaborate on the fact that the Greeks put their alphabet 
Okay, what what happens with the with the uh, Greek sororities? One thing is that when you have a culture that is trying to establish itself and run the world, then you put your images in your language. For instance, the, the sororities. Any person that jumps into an, a sorority that's Greek has to be lost, no matter what kind of social. Uh, kinds of, of, of benefits you get behind it or from it. Um, you're looking at an alien culture and someone worshiping an alien culture. That's as bad as walking into a church and you see a white Jesus up on the wall. One thing that I found that, that, that really inspired me too is some young brothers at Morehouse College have organized a fraternity and they call the fraternity Kemet. And with the people that they're working with, they are going to use the metal nature as symbols on their sweaters and so forth. And their requirements, some of the requirements of their reading are Dr. Ben's works, John Clark and other people's work are in that. Uh, but the, the whole cultural adaptation of the Greek fraternities is another aspect of our stolen legacy. I didn't get into that because I had some striking photographs of some of the rituals that these Greek fraternities go through, the hazing methods and so forth. Yes. in that um, your Masonic teachings, for instance, if you are involved in that or geared toward that, the teachings that you learn are just stolen legacies or lessons from the African Nile Valley. Uh, even the symbols, uh, if you take, for instance, when we went to the tomb of Seti One, we're walking down this rampway I think Reverend Brown was in front of me, and on the wall was a, sum, a painting of an Egyptian priest. If you know anything about masonry, the stance, the foot that you step off on, everything is there. Those teachings are nothing but stolen teachings from the Nile Valley. What has happened is the credit to our people, if they were to give and open up the credit for the Masonic teachings to African people. Just think what that would do. If they won't recognize our contribution to Western civilization, and then the whole Masonic teachings, a lot of it keeps this country running. Even with the dollar bill you know of, the all-seeing eye of Heru and so forth, all of those symbols are there. And the point is, that even when you look at some of the Masonic teachings, books of manuals, you see a case where Hiram or Biff is really Osiris, and they Europeanize him, and he becomes Hiram Abiff. All of that is involved in this whole stolen legacy process. Yes. In one of your slides, you showed an excerpt from the book by Herbert Wendt, mm -hmm. Man. Mm -hmm. Is that book still available? You can 
The only way you could probably get the book is through a rare bookstore, using rare bookstore. But the quote that I took that from is from a book called What They Never Taught You in Your History Class. And I forgot the brother's name, but you can get it here in New York. Mm -hmm. Yes. Seaman, and in Italy, and uh, Romania, and other parts of Europe, um, even in South Africa, there were certain things that he saw, blackness, mm -hmm. that here in America, we didn't know about. So perhaps the European was not as vicious as the Americans when they bought their slaves, because no, no, I understand no one has been as brainwashed as the so-called American black. And as a result, here, these, uh, because of the quality of the people, the fact that they were from the prisons of England and also the dead beats from other uh, mm -hmm. parts of the world that mm -hmm. came here to settle, like the Indians. Perhaps that's one reason why also that we don't know as much about it as uh, those people who may be living in other countries by the suppressed from us. Okay. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that, that um, the situation was less in European countries. I think it's a political thing when you see what happens in Eastern European countries because one, Eastern European countries are deeply involved in the African continent and other parts of the world where African people are concerned, whether it's for detrimental reasons or for good reasons. What you have in this country uh, is a large concentration of African people. And the best way to keep a person in control is not to educate him and to not to teach him about himself. Wherever you see African people in the world, unless they control that part of the world themselves, they're going to be on bottom unless they're fighting like you know what to get out of it. Just as Brother Applin mentioned at the beginning of the program, we're fighting in South Africa, we're fighting all over the world. And also in Eastern and European countries, you still have remnants, for instance, in Poland and in other places, you still have the Black Madonnas. Uh, you, you have, ex yeah, and, yeah, I know, in Hungary, uh, in Russia, in other parts of the world, you have those Black Madonnas. But, but see, what you have here is the fact that they will not teach you about, quote, black history or the Negro first here and there let alone teach us about what you just saw. Our responsibility is to gather this information because I know for a fact that certain kinds of information get mysteriously disappears. Then you will see 30 years later or a generation later some white publication have put it back out making millions of dollars on it. But it's our task to teach our story and our legacy. Uh, these other countries, for instance, uh, in Russia, uh, is taught, but it's not something that they put totally out in the open, that Pushkin was the father of Russian literature and they have his statue in Leningrad. But you know, it's our legacy that we need, and the first story we need to get straight is our legacy in ancient Kemet, and also concerning the origin of man in Africa. Because if, even if you go back to the early history of Europe with the Grimaldis, you find that we were there too. And if you deal with the migrations of the six species of man out of Africa, where three stayed and three left, and they went up into Europe, and then in the uh, Grotto of Infants, you find us, and you find our artwork, even as far as Siberia. You know, uh, I think that it's a story that we have to tell. I don't think it's lesser of a story because they are in Europe. One of the things would be because 
If you're going to teach someone to go to try to control someone or go on the African continent, you have to teach them something about the people. For instance, Van Sertema mentioned and Walter Rodney mentioned how at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, how they were taught certain things in a certain way. You teach them a little bit of that history so when they go in, they relate to the people. But you're going in to control and rule the people. So that's one of the reasons why they get another story. And also the fact that you get a little bit of liberalism uh, in some, you know, countries. In 1950, uh, in South Africa, in 1951, uh, um, someone showed me the New York Times, mm. I believe it, where they, they took out the last vestiges of hope, people of South Africa, black in the Sons of Solomon, where it begins, I am black economy, or he sends in your design. Mm -hmm. They changed it to, to say, I've been darkened by the sun. I see. As I said, take, take away that last hope. Mm -hmm. Even so, any association of strength, mm -hmm. spiritual strength. Well, see. One thing you get, and I, that's why I like this setting and the murals and wall on the walls and everything, because you instill that in a young person at an early age, no matter what they do to try to destroy your hope, it can never be suppressed. That's why you have Africans in South Africa uh, having this, what they call a Kentucky Fried Chicken. They take an inner tube and put it around a Tom's neck if he's out there cohabitating with the enemy. You know. It's our hope and our journey, and it's our hope, for instance, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, Dr. William Mackey and John Clark and all these people who labored for generations, spent their whole life teaching us this information when we didn't want to listen. But look where we are now. We're right here. But it's our legacy to try to hold on to it and build on it. And until we take the books, we take the images, we take the stories and hold on to it, nobody else will do it. That's why it's a cultural genocide going on among African people. The sister. Okay, I would suggest that you start out, now you want to read something on the Stolen Legacy, I would suggest the first book that you should read that tells the story of what we possibly lost. He gives a good scope, the first 63 pages of Destruction of Black Civilization, showing what we had and what we came from. Then I would go with Henry O'Leela's book, From Ancient Africa to Ancient Greece, because what he does, he goes further than James does in a lot of ways. He takes the Pythagorean theorem, he takes the Mephite theology, and he breaks it down. And he shows you how it relates to modern culture and modern heritage. Uh, it was published in Atlanta by Select Press of Destruction of Black Civilization. Yeah. Chancellor Williams. Right. Um, also, uh, if you want uh, a good source book on information uh, on that legacy, the Journal of African Civilizations, the one dealing with the Nile Valley Conference would be good because it gives you a panoramic scope of what was going on in the Nile Valley, from pyramid buildings to the House of Life, Cairo Academy, and so forth. Um, then the, the, the one specifically dealing with Europe would be uh, uh, Van Sertema's journal, uh, was it the African Presence in Europe. Uh, then I have a whole list of articles that's in the bibliography that I'll leave that details all the legacy from Petrie's work on down to C.C. Uh, Cipher, uh, people such as, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Azikwe from Nigeria, these people who were doing the early work in the field. So I'll, you know, I'll make sure that um, uh, Mr. Appleton get a copy of it. Yes. Can you shed some light on the 